and I hear a noise. And I look up, this is at twilight, and there's this happening in the sky. And I said, well, actually, that's what I'm talking about. Um, they look like things, shifting shape in the sky, don't they? But in fact, these are hundreds of thousands of starlings migrating through Rome from Central Europe to Africa on their annual migration. So I said, the way that looks like a thing when you're looking at it from this far, but you know it's made of birds, the hand I'm using to point at it is a hand, but it's also a flock of cells self-organizing into this sort of behavior. And it's the same thing. It's exactly the same principle. So whether you exist as yourself depends on level of scale. At this point, you're listening to me, Nataran, and I'm looking at a bunch of faces of individuals. But at the microscopic level, we're just a room full of ant colonies made of cells. And in fact, if you, you cannot live, as you probably have been taught, without the, um, there are four trillion cells in your body, an estimate. There are 400 trillion bacteria in your GI tract, without which you die. So you have 100 times more cells in the ant colony the cellular ant colony of your body, then you have cells of you. It takes the entire colony to make you a living person. So think about that alone. What are you? You think, well, my mother and my father, and then their genes, and blah, blah, blah. That's only 1% of the ant colony that makes you a living, thinking, breathing person. Another way to diagram this is that cells turn into bodies, and bodies self-organize into communities. And depending on what kind of bodies you define, um, then defines what kind of communities you're talking about. Whether it's cities, cultures, ecosystems, if you've heard of the Gaia hypothesis of James Lovelock, that the whole body is an organism, again, before complexity, he was already talking about this stuff. Biomolecules, and we're coming down the home stretch here, so don't worry, you'll be out in like three minutes. Um, are cells a completely defined entity, or are they just phenomena arising from smaller things? Well, biomolecules would be the obvious possibility for what smaller things they are. are there, do they fit the criteria? Well, there are plenty of them. We know there are enough biomolecules. We know that they often interact through negative feedback loops. Um, no molecule is figuring out what the whole system is doing. They don't even know whether they're inside a cell or outside of a cell. Is there quench disorder in the system? And here's another thing where your teachers lied to you. Um, I was giving a talk on stem cells in 2003 at a nanotechnology conference in Switzerland, because there were a couple of years where everyone wanted to hear about stem cells. And the guy who gave the talk after me is this guy, Toshio Yanagida from Japan, um, who does a very persnickety little experiment. He wants to see how biomolecular pairs interact with each other, not in groups, but individually. And he showed a video of taking an actin filament, holding it on a, fluor on a microscope, a fluorescent microscope stage with laser tweezers, which I thought was pretty cool. So it's a single actin filament. And he put into the solution a single myosin filament with a fluorescent tag on it so you could watch it. And the, the myosin attaches to the actin. And what you would think by what you've been taught is you would add in the ATP and the myosin would walk across the actin, right? Well, that's not what happened. What happened is you put the myosin in, it attaches, and then it starts bouncing randomly all over the place because every molecule in your body and all molecule pairings that people have looked at in this way now work this way, um, Brownian motion, the water molecules are bouncing them around. So they're moving all over the place. And when you add the ATP, it's just the right amount of energy not to move the molecule, but to quench the randomness into unidirectional motion. And it turns out that when you eat to supply the energy for your body, it's not to supply the energy of physiology, the water in your body at body temperature supplies that energy, and the food you eat supplies the energy to quench that disorder into purposeful physiologic organi organized behavior. So cells only seem to exist at one level, but they're simply phenomena arising from self-organization of biomolecules. This brings us back to the cellular uncertainty question. Um, I got to publish oddly in Nature in 2005 a paper called Cell Doctrine, Now You See It, Now You Don't. Cell Doctrine, modern biology and medicine see the cell as the fundamental building block of living organisms, but this concept breaks down at different perspectives and scales. Nature wrote that. Um, uh, when we say Western medicine and Western biology, what we mean is it's our understanding of bodies being made of cells. Cell Doctrine is what defines Western medicine and biology.
So the last paragraph of the paper, I wrote, the validity of cell doctrine depends on the scale at which the body is observed. To limit ourselves to the perspective of this model may mean that explications of some bodily phenomena remain outside the capacity of modern biology. My mother. Um, <laughs> she's very sweet, but needy. Um, <laughs> An example I used is acupuncture, because if you dissect down a meridians and acupoints, there's no anatomic structure there. People have looked. There are no nerves, fascial planes, etc. So if you can't explain something in terms of anatomy, how can you explain it in terms of the building blocks of anatomy, namely cells? You need a different model of the body. And in this paper, I suggested some other possible models. Um, before we had microscopes, it was a matter of philosophy what made the body up. And from Greek times on, it was thought it's either indivisible subunits they called atoms, or it's an endlessly divisible fluid. And when we had microscopes and call, saw cell walls and cell membranes, we could say, oh, empty box, four walls, ceiling, and floor, nothing inside it, that's not divisible. End of the debate. The body is made of indivisible subunits called atoms. They were then renamed cells, like the cell of a monk or a prisoner, because there was no furniture in the room. 20 years it took before they could stain tissues to identify nuclei and then fill in everything else. And so that's how cell doctrine was born. What if the technology had been a little different and the first thing they saw were nuclei? They'd say, oh look, the body is an endlessly divisible fluid. There are these little round things floating in it, we'll figure out what those are, but fluid doctrine would have been the model. 20 years later when they saw cell membranes and figured out the nuclear membrane, they wouldn't have said, oh we were wrong. They would have said, Oh, there's semi-permeable partitioning of the fluid compartment. And Western medicine and biology would be about fluid medicine. So I published this in Cell, that cells don't actually exist and cell doctrine is not the whole story, and you'd think I'd get a response. I got two emails. <laughs> um, both because I mentioned acupuncture. And I don't have time to tell you about one, which is really cool. Um, but one of the, the other, <laughs> that's also cool but not as cool, um, came from this guy, oh, stop it. Um, <laughs> that's my boss. Um, <laughs> so Edward Yang, former chair of electrical engineering at Columbia, now in Hong Kong. And he's ad adapting MRI machines to measure acoustic waves in tissue. And he wrote to me and said, how do you know what we're doing research-wise because we haven't published it yet? I said, I don't know who you are and I don't know what you're doing. And he said, well, we're looking at acupuncture and if you put a needle in a non-acupoint, then you get a and stimulate it, you get a little acoustic wave about a centimeter in all directions. But if you pit, put the needle on an acupoint, you get an acoustic wave that travels all the way along the meridian in both directions. So you can start to explain some aspects of acupuncture by thinking of the body as a fluid. Um, extending down, where do biomolecules come from? Well, they're nothing but organizing, uh, organization of self-organizing atoms. And if you think about it, if we, you know, depending where we draw the timeline, boundaries, every atom in our bodies comes from the earth. The water, the air you breathe, the food you eat. So, in fact, um, your bodies are just atoms derived from the earth that are self-organizing into us. And so we think of us as living and all the life on the planet as living on the planet, but the fact is, historically, we are Earth that has self-organized itself into bits of little concrete uh, items that think they have consciousness and can talk to each other. So we don't actually live on the Earth, we are Earth that walks and talks. And that's the way he life has developed on the planet. Where do atoms come from? Subatomic particles which self-organize. Those come from smaller subatomic particles and now we're in the quantum realm and this is that meeting that Rachel mentioned. There's the Dalai Lama. There's me. This is Diane, who I did the stem cell work with. This is Bill Bichelle, who I collaborate on this crazy stuff with. Notice Mehmet Oz, very close to the Dalai Lama. Notice Dean Ornish, desperately trying to get in as close, if not closer. <laughs> Bob Thurman, Uma's father, etc. And so in this volume, but you can get the paper on my website, I took this one step further. Um, we can think of bodies as macroscopic, microscopic, nanoscopic, and bodies at the quantum level. And your bodies exist, our bodies exist at all these levels. And we know in terms of medicine, we can interact with it in all these ways. Um, we can interact with it as pipes, 
we can do bone marrow transplants, we can interact with it at the molecular level, and we can do things like electromagnetics for healing fractures. So we do therapeutics at all levels of scale of the body, and you're selecting which level of scale, which body you're using at the time. You look at Eastern applications, and they do the same thing. So yoga and Tai Chi works at the macroscopic body, though things propagate downwards, and this is one of the areas we're investigating. Maybe acupuncture works at the cellular level, but propagates in all directions. Traditional remedies, just like our pharmaceuticals, energy healing, meditation, maybe this is all working at the quantum level. And so we can, this turns out to map onto what Tibetan and Indian and Chinese uh, medics will talk about coarse body, energy body, and subtle body, which I've always had a tough time with because we don't exist as boxes and boxes and boxes. But when I said maybe we're talking about the level of scale, all the Tibetan doctors in the room were like, that's exactly what we're talking about. So this provides a language that maybe we can now bridge some of the cultural gaps of some of the Asian systems, for example, and our Western systems. And then subatomic particles come from the smallest, ultimate smallest thing, which arise from this energetic vacuum. This there's consensus about whatever the smallest things are, strings or not. Um, these derive from uh, the energetic vacuum or generative void in what's called the quantum foam. And where that takes, which I'm not going to bother going into now, leads us to the idea that the universe itself is not a box. It's not a place in which we live. Um, we are, in fact, the universe. And this translates into Buddhist terms in terms of at this level of scale, this is the relative world. Um, from the lowest level of scale, it's the absolute. And from there, we can get to Buddhist metaphysics, Jewish mysticism, and Hindu mysticism, which I'm not going to throw at you today. So from the tiniest bile ducts, <laughs> we're now talking about the nature of existence, which is a little, you know, a <laughs> little weird. These are all the people I collaborated with to do all this work. Thank you for your attention.